welcome to Every Nation South Downs. My name is Yane and this is Paprika. Oh no, Kira. <gasps> I got her name wrong. But anyways, and we are your hosts tonight. As you can see, ooh, she's making a jump for it and she's not in the mood at all for hosting with me tonight. But thank you for joining us for tonight's service. We trust that you will enjoy it with us. So we want to start off today with highlighting a few celebrations and we'll start off with the birthdays. Um, Anna Marie, one of our missionaries in Mozambique, celebrated her birthday this week and it's also Moira's birthday today. So we just want to say happy birthday ladies. And then Milani and Hanlu celebrated their wedding anniversary. So congratulations to you. And then um, Martinette also started a new connect group. So we are so happy with you. <laughs> if you have or if you know anyone with celebrations, please feel welcome to post it in our comment section below and we'll celebrate with you. Um, I just quickly want to pray for, for all of you. Yes, thank you Father God that we can come together and that we can celebrate life with you, that we can celebrate another another year, another wedding anniversary and also a new connect, connect group. We thank you for all the blessings and the opportunities and for life and thank you for being on our side. We just love you. Amen. If you're joining us today for the very first time, we would love to ex extend a special and warm welcome to you and hope that you feel encouraged today. You will see in the comment section there is a WhatsApp link that you can click on to let us know that you are new uh, or if you don't have WhatsApp, there's also a connection card that you can fill in with your details and we will get in contact with you. Um, then also, okay, so here are some things that are happening in church today or this week. Yeah, forgot. <laughs> Here are some things that are happening in church. Every Sunday after church, we are having a church after party. Well, you are welcome to join us on a Zoom call um, and to interact with one another. Now, over to Yaku. Thank you, Yane. Friends, I just want to share a short message of gratitude towards you as the church. And if you're visiting us tonight, please just do bear with me for a short moment as I just speak to the Every Nation South Downs people. I've always just admired and openly celebrated your generosity when it comes to the kingdom of God, not just giving towards people or giving towards missions and just specifically now in this time also giving towards the social responsibility efforts through the Give Help and Get Help initiative. But you're giving specifically towards the church. And over the past couple of months, I really wanted today honor you, celebrate you and thank you for continually giving towards the church. I want to highlight three things that your giving is amplifying in this time. Firstly, it acknowledges that we see God as the source, that He is the owner of everything, that everything belongs to Him, everything comes from Him. As the Bible says, every good gift comes from the Lord and we are stewards of what God has entrusted to us. Secondly, it speaks about your belief in the vision of the church, that you believe in what God has called us to do together. And your giving, your continued giving, enables us to keep on doing what God has called us as a church to do. And thirdly, it speaks about you trusting God with your seed. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. But whoever sows generously will also reap generously. See, when we put our seed into the ground through our giving, then we are saying, God, I'm going to trust that this will bear fruit and that it'll bear much fruit and that your kingdom will be advanced, your kingdom will be impacted, your kingdom will be lifted up through this seed. And again, I just want to celebrate you. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your generous hearts towards the kingdom of God. And, and I'd love just to pray for us. And even for you, maybe not part of the church, I'd love to just include you in this prayer. Father, I thank you that I can just bring our lives before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we can bring our finances before you. 
And just tonight, Lord, acknowledge that you are the source. You are the owner of everything. And we bring our prayers, Lord, to the God who has no lack. We pray, Lord, a blessing over our finances. We pray a blessing, Lord, over our workplaces. And Father, I kind of specifically pray, Lord, for those who have just been faithfully giving, Lord, and sowing. We pray, Lord, that you will bless the seed that is in the ground, that you will make it come forth, Lord, and bring, bring forth a great harvest. And tonight, Lord, we want to pray for those who are trusting you for provision, whether it is to get through the end of the month, whether it is, Lord, for a new job opportunity or maybe just a job opportunity where their work has been affected just throughout these past couple of weeks or months, Lord. And we just come and lift our prayers to the God who sees, who hears, and who knows our very need even before we ask. But we bring these needs to you, Lord, and we ask that you will provide for them. Father, we thank you that you are the source and that you are good. And just again, that every good gift comes from you. And we ask for this, we pray for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, I'm going to hand over directly to Marielle, who's going to be sharing the word with us tonight. And, and I know that God has got a very specific message. And I pray that you'll be blessed, that you'll be encouraged, and that you will hear God speak to you tonight. Thank you, Marielle. Good evening, church. Hello, friends. Hello, family. Hello to everyone that's maybe new and joining us for the first time. Welcome. We are busy with a sermon series speaking about the very interesting and sometimes difficult topic of where is God in pain and suffering? Why is there so much pain and suffering that we see in this world that we experience in our own lives? And where is God? Is He just sitting around, not being involved? Why does He not intervene? And the past two weeks, Yaku did an incredible job at just helping us to get a new perspective of how we should start thinking about these questions. And like Yaku mentioned, uh, we don't have all the answers. And these topics isn't something that you just quickly watch a sermon on and all of a sudden everything is fixed and you understand everything. It takes time. It takes time to seek truth, to really want to understand, to really want to um, find the answers that you need and we want to encourage you to keep looking for truth. We also have discussions during the week where you can join us on a Zoom call and ask some questions, um, especially if during the sermon something stirs and, and you realize I'm wondering about this and, and I'd like to speak to someone about it. So please look in the comments section and join us during the week for that Zoom call. But also, if you maybe missed the previous two sermons, I would encourage you to go on YouTube on our Every Nation South Downs page and please do go and look at these sermons. And so tonight we're going to speak about disappointment. Where is God amidst disappointment? And uh, this, again, is not a quick, short answer, but I want to encourage you um, sometimes when we look for quick answers, for easy answers, and we just start to answer these things for ourselves, we often end up uh, with less than God's best for us. We often end up without the truth and, and just finding our own truth and creating our own truth. And that's not always good. Um, easy answers sometimes lead to weak convictions, which causes you to fall around in life because anyone can convince you otherwise. So take the time to really seek truth and remember that the more difficult the question, the more glorious the answer. When we have difficult questions, it's good to spend the time, read some books, listen to what different scholars on the topic is saying, and pray, seek God, and ask God to answer you in that. And that's what I want to ask you to do today as well as we speak on disappointment. We all face disappointment. All of us have had some points in our life where we thought that something was going to happen and it happened otherwise. Or where we get a phone call and we get some bad news, maybe about a close family member, and we're so disappointed. Fear floods our whole being and we just feel so overwhelmed. And if you think of disappointment in this year, 2020, I mean, what a year. 
uh, I think no one expected everything that's been happening this year. And we don't know what to expect for the months and years to come. We don't know what's going to happen with this COVID-19 thing. And many people had to cancel weddings. Some people had to cancel travel plans. Some people lost their jobs and their income. A lot of disappointment is happening in this time. And disappointment isn't something that starts when you turn 18 or 21. It's something that you have even as a little child. When your parents promise you that you're going to go to the beach in the afternoon and it rains and your dad says, we can't go anymore, I'm sorry. That's a massive disappointment for a child. And we need to learn that disappointment is a part of life, but we can't just suppress it and move on and act like it doesn't bother us. It does. It hurts. And we need to acknowledge that and move forward with God, not without God. And that's what we're going to speak about today. How do we face disappointment and look it straight in the face and admit the pain, admit the sorrow, admit the loss, and grieve it in a healthy way, not allowing our emotions to completely take over and become completely emotion-led and go and sit in a, be stuck in depression. But how do we grieve properly and still find the healing that we need to move on to find hope? And hope is something that we really need. Hope is something that God gives us. Hope is something that anchors us in the midst of the storms of life, in the midst of the confusion of life. In those moments when you need to make big decisions and you're scared, there's fear on all sides and you don't know what's going to happen, but you have to be brave and take the courage and make the decision. In those moments, we look for hope. We look for something in the future that we can look forward to, even though we don't actually know if that thing is really going to happen. And as believers, we do have a hope that's not just anchored in this life, anchored in something that you're hoping is going to happen at the end of the year, something that you're looking forward to, or something that you're hoping will happen in 10 years from now or 30 years from now. Our hope is eternal. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. It's in the good news of the gospel that we can look to something that's beyond this life. And today, as we're going to speak about hope, I want you to know that God wants you to have hope. You need hope to dream, to be the person that you are called to be. We all need hope to actually look to our desires and have the courage to dream about those desires and then to pursue them without fear, without holding back, without being scared. And that is something that, that God comes and does in us. But when we lose hope, we lose the battle and the enemy knows that. The enemy wants to steal our hope so that we cannot continue. And he uses disappointment in our lives to do that. And it's so important for us to understand disappointment, but still be able to understand that God is with us. He is for us. He is still working on our behalf, even when we don't feel it, even when we don't experience it. And so I want to take you to a scripture in Proverbs 13. 13 verse 12 it says hope deferred makes the heart sick but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life hope deferred so you were hoping for something and it didn't happen that's disappointment makes our hearts sick and I'm going to explain a little bit later on on how that happens why does our hearts get sick but I think all of us have experienced that where you just experience that moment where your spirit is so crushed because you are so excited about this thing that's going to happen, that's going to come, and then it doesn't. It doesn't happen. And your expectations all fall to the ground. And you're so angry. And you're asking questions. You're like, why? Why did this happen? Why did it not work out? Why did this curveball come? I did not see this happening. This is not how I expected it. This is not what I was planning and hoping. But when our desires get fulfilled, it's a tree of life. It's that moment when you hope for something and you see it happening. And we've all experienced that as well, where you're so thankful, you're so overwhelmed with this thing, this gift that almost feels supernatural, that it, it gives you courage to try other things, greater things. When we look at how Jesus 
approached difficult circumstances. Jesus was completely God, but he was also 100% human when he was on earth. He wasn't this type of human that didn't feel pain, that didn't experience disappointment. He had all the emotions that we face today. And as he was going to the cross, it wasn't as if he was exempted from all of the fear that anyone would feel that would have to go through that kind of suffering. He knew what was coming. And when he was sitting in the Garden of Gethsemane, the next day, knowing that he has to go through the suffering, he was speaking to God the Father and he knew, he knew what was coming. And, and in that moment of just being real with, with God the Father, he prayed and he said, if it's possible, take this cup from me. If it's possible, don't let me go through this. But not my will, but your will be done. So in that moment, Jesus had certain expectations and he knew this is not going to go well. I mean, that kind of pain, that kind of suffering, he knew it's not going to be easy. But his hope was beyond the situation. He knew that God had a bigger plan. He knew there was a greater purpose. He knew what would happen three days later. And we don't always know what's going to happen, but we need to have that expectancy to say, God, I am hoping for this, but even if it doesn't work out, I'm going to keep my eyes on you. I'm going to keep my heart open to you. And I'm going to believe that you have a better plan. Now, when we look in Matthew 16, how the disciples handled the cross, it's a completely different story. So they did not know what was going to happen. They did not understand, even though in all the prophetic books, we read about what is said about Jesus and the Messiah that would come, but they didn't understand it. They didn't interpret it right. And I think it's the same for us. Sometimes God gives us a promise and we know the promise, but the way that we think it's going to play out is not exactly the way that God plans for it to play out. And so in Matthew 16, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he's telling them what's going to happen. So I'm going to read from verse 21 to 23, where Jesus says, uh, or it says there, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. This is a very strange encounter between Jesus and Peter. But the thing is, Jesus had expectancy. He had hope that something good was going to come from this. Whereas Peter, he had this expectation that Jesus is the Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the King that was promised from the line of David that supposed to come and overthrow the Roman rule and come and establish a new kingdom. That was what the disciples thought God was going to come and do. But Jesus' plan of the kingdom that he was bringing was not just a new kingdom of the Ro uh, overthrowing the Roman rule. It was a kingdom that until this day is being established and will continue unto all eternity. But because the disciples was limited in their understanding, they could not see it. Their expectations set them up for disappointment. And that's why when Peter rebukes him and said, No, no, Jesus, this is not what I expected. This is not what I want to happen. Jesus rebukes him back and says, Get behind me, Satan. So why does he say Satan? Now all of a sudden he, he, he acts as if, as if Peter is possessed by the devil. The reason being because when we have our own mindset of what needs to happen and we have expectations and we set ourselves up for disappointment, we are agreeing with the enemy saying that we have better plans than what God has and we are in control. And that's what he says in the next sentence. He says to him, you are a hindrance to me for you are setting your mind not on the things of God, but on the things of man. You are thinking with human knowledge and human wisdom and you need to stop and you need to let go and let God be God. And so it's two different approaches. Peter has expectations where he thinks he is control. Jesus has expectancy where he knows God is in control. And 
We also see in Luke 24, two disciples after Jesus has been crucified, after Jesus is raised from the dead, they are walking to a city close to Jerusalem. And they're talking about how disappointed they are because their expectations haven't been met. So let's read in Luke 24, verse 13 to 35. It says there, That very day two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Okay, so they're talking, they're telling each other how disappointed they are, how they don't understand what happened, what went wrong. And Jesus is coming closer and he's joining the conversation, but they don't know that it's Jesus. And it says there, and he said to them, what is the conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So Jesus is, is almost acting like, I don't know what's happening. Tell me, like, what's, what's really going on? Um, and obviously Jesus knew. I mean, it happened to him. He knows exactly what's going on. But he wants to hear their part of the story. He wants them to tell him what their expectations were and what disappointment they are currently facing. So it goes on then to say, um, or they said, they answered him, and they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Do you hear that? We had hoped. They had hoped that he would redeem them, that he would do all these things for them. But their hope was deferred. Things didn't happen as they expected. And now their hearts are crushed. Their hearts are sick. It goes on to say, yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. And moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, so up to this point, they're explaining to him, we are so confused. We don't know what happened. We are so disappointed. And now these women are saying things and we don't even know if we can believe them. And uh, Jesus answers them and he says, oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the, the things concerning himself. So in this moment, Jesus hears them out and he listens to their disappointment and their confusion. And then he calls him back and he says, O oh, foolish ones. And he starts telling them about all the scriptures in the Old Testament that they knew. They were Jews. Growing up, they need to know the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is full of stories of this hope that was to come. And even though it didn't come in the way that they expected it to, they were so disappointed that their expectations didn't work out, that they couldn't see what God was actually doing. And the same thing happens to us. When we have expectations, we set ourselves up for failure and for disappointment. Because expectations suggest that you are in charge. It gives you the illusion that you're the boss of what's going to happen. That you know, because you just know everything, right? You know how your life should work out. You know how things should work out for your family. You have the best plan. And then, when things don't work out the way that we planned and that we expected, we're so shocked. We're like, I can't believe it. I can't believe it didn't work out. Where is God? What's going on? What's happening? And we get so stuck in this disappointment that we struggle to see that there's something else going on, something greater, something bigger. And in essence, Disappointment is actually like living in a box. 
Your expectations creates a box. And this is what you want. These are the things that you expected. You dreamt about it. You've planned it. You designed it. And dreaming and having desires and having plans is not wrong. God encourages us through the scriptures. And he even says in one of the scriptures that he knows the desires of our hearts because it is him that gave us those desires. So some of the desires in your heart is good. But the problem with expectations are that we create this box. And we expect God to come and live in this box. And he needs to fit into our box. And he needs to stick to our boundaries. And he needs to be God in our box. But actually what we're saying is, I'm in control. I designed this box. And now you're living not in God's design, but you're actually living in your own design. And you're expecting God to stay in your box and be God in your box. But I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that God's not going to live in your box. Because God doesn't fit in your box. God is greater and bigger than what you can understand, than what you can think. With our human minds, we are limited in our understanding. We are limited by time. We are limited by space. We are limited by so many things where God is beyond us. And he's busy with something bigger. He's busy with something greater. And these expectations come into our lives without us really realizing how much we are holding on to them. How much we are putting our hope in these expectations. So now we think we've got everything figured out. I've got God all figured out. He's in this Bible, this book, and I just know everything about God and he cannot get out of my box. But God is a good God. He's a faithful God, but is also, also all-powerful, almighty. You cannot figure him out. You cannot predict God. He is beyond our human thinking and our human understanding. And what happens is, as we get disappointed because our expectations didn't work out, pretty soon we become so distracted with what didn't happen, with the lack, the not. So you expected a car and it didn't happen. Or you expected that you were going to marry this person and they broke up with you. Or you expected that you would be pregnant by now and you're not. And you're so focused on what you don't have that you're struggling to see that God is busy with something bigger. He is working on something else. And that's what Jesus did with the disciples. He showed them, look at the scriptures. This was planned. This is part of God's plan. And he is working now. And later on in that scripture, if you keep on reading the story, Jesus goes in and eats with them and he breaks the bread. And as he breaks the bread, they realize it's Jesus and then he disappears. So he shows them the hope and he teaches them, look beyond what you're seeing right now. Look beyond what you're understanding right now. As we face this disappointment, we also begin to believe lies. We begin to believe lies like, I need to protect myself from God. I can't trust God. I need to take back the control of my life because clearly I hoped and I prayed and I asked God for this and he didn't come through. So now in this area of my life, I'm going to be God. I'm going to take back the control. And we start living small because we're scared to dream again. We're scared to hope again because we were so disappointed. And this box of expectations can be any area of your life. It can be family. It can be marriage. It can be finances. Sometimes it can be your career. You were hoping that you were going to get that job and then someone else got it, or you thought that you were going to get into that university for that course, and then you didn't. And now it feels like your whole world is falling apart, and all your hopes and dreams and plans are gone. But you don't realize that there are so many other options. And the enemy wants you to believe that you are better at creating a good life and a life plan and dreams for yourself than God is that you are smarter, that you know better, that you know what's going to be best for you, that you know what you want. But God knows better. God is good. God loves you. He will not withhold good things from you. He promises that in Scripture to us. And even if you look at Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, 
The enemy spoke to them and he said the same thing to them. He said, did God really say? What he's actually saying to them there is, God just doesn't want you to find out that you are so much better at this than he is. You are so much better at making plans for your life. And that's not true. That is so not true. God is the creator of the universe. He is the one that's writing the story. He's the one that created you. He's the one that put you here. He has a plan for your life. And that plan is not a bad plan. I can guarantee you. There are so many things in my life that haven't worked out the way that I thought. And looking back now, I'm thankful that it didn't work out. Because those dreams were actually so small compared to the things that God has given me and the way that he has led me to the places that I've been and the things that I'm doing now. And even today, God challenges me to dream big. And sometimes an opportunity comes across my path and I realize I'm so scared to say yes to this because somewhere I had a disappointment that I didn't face, that I didn't really work through, that I didn't bring to God and say, Lord, I thought that this would be best, but I trust you and I let it go and I give it back to you. And when we read in Romans 8, we see this. We see how Paul writes and he says that in this life, as we're facing the, the trials and the suffering, in verse 18, he says, this current pain and suffering that we're facing is nothing compared to the future glory that God has prepared for us. It's nothing. God has greater things for you, but you cannot get those things if you're not willing to let go, if you're not willing to give it up. And if you continue reading in Romans 8, in verse 28, he promises, he says, for God makes everything work together for good who those, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If you love God and you are willing to, to live for his purposes of your life, I can guarantee you that he always has a better plan for you. And I understand that we do live in a fallen and a broken world. And some of the things that happen in your life is inflicted not by God, but by human error. We live in a world full of flawed human beings that might hurt you that might do things that, that's not good. But God says, whatever the enemy meant for evil, he will turn it around and he will make it good. If you go and read the story of Joseph, that's what it says in the end. The enemy meant it for evil, but God turned it around for good. And he wants to come and do that in your life. Whatever your situation is, I don't know what happened. I don't know what your disappointments are, but I can promise you if you're willing to go to God with it and you're not checking out in the middle of the process. He's going to turn it around for good. He's going to redeem it. Everything in your life, God can redeem. He is greater. He is bigger. That's why Jesus came, so that we can be healed, so that we can be restored, so that we can find healing, and so that we can have a testimony, testimony, so that everything that the enemy, the weapons that the enemy has tried to use against you God will take that weapon out of his hand and put it in your hand so that you can go and free the captives, other people that are going through the same things that you went through. And God is calling you to let go of your expectations, to say, Lord, I believe that you have better plans for me than my box, than my expectations, than my hopes and dreams and plans. And again, it's not wrong to hope and dream and plan. God needs us to dream big. He's calling us to dream big. But if you allow expectations and disappointment to get to your heart, you start turning away from God. You start turning away from yourself. And you stop living with courage. You stop living to be the person that you are actually called to be. And you start doing only things that you can control. Things that you don't need faith for. Things that you can do without God. And that's not a life of fulfillment. That's not what God has prepared for you. You need to remember who you are. You need to remember whose you are. You are God's child and he has better plans for you than this box. So you need to put the box away. And you need to come to God with an open tray and say, Lord, this is my life. You can come here and build whatever you want. You can come and be God. I don't want to be God. I don't want to take control. I don't want that fear and pressure and anxiety and depression of trying to rule my own life. You can come and be God. And there's no boundaries here. You can't limit God here. 
He can move outside of your lines and he can add things to your life and he can take things away from your life. And in the midst of all of that, you can say, you give and take away, but you are good, God. And I believe that you have what's best in mind for me. And he does. He does. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what gifts he has given you. He dreams bigger dreams for you than you dream yourself. So I want to ask you today, if you have had some disappointments, if you have had some moments where your expectations were crushed, maybe right now you're facing a disappointment where you're trusting God for something and it's not happening. It's not coming. And it could be a good uh, expectation that you have, something that God has placed in your heart. But right now is not his timing and we don't understand why. We don't understand, you know, why, why God sometimes leaves us to wait for things, to wait for the promise. But you need to desire him more than that thing that you're hoping for, whatever it is. If you're placing all of your hope in a certain situation to work out or in something that you're going to get, then your hope is already misplaced. Your hope should be in this God that loves you. And in that moment, we need to be able to say, God, I'm so disappointed. And I want you to think of things in your life right now where you've been disappointed, where you've felt crushed. Maybe right now you're facing a disappointment. And I want you to say to God, what the enemy meant for evil, I believe that you, God, will turn it around for good. Because Romans 8.28 says, that God makes everything work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So I'm going to pray for us now. And after that, we're going to sing a song together. Um, the song's lyrics says that I'm holding on to faith because right now it doesn't feel like things are working out. Um, and the lyric says that we don't always understand and we don't always get to see, but we can believe in God because of the faithfulness that we saw that he's been faithful in our lives in so many areas and he'll be faithful now and in that moment you have to say God I don't understand I don't see what you see but I have to believe that you are good you are faithful you are true you are in control you are all powerful you can do anything and I believe that you are going to work this thing for the good of me father because you love me and you are calling me according to your purposes. So let me pray for us. God, thank you that we can come to you and surrender our lives. Lord, I want to pray for every single person that is facing disappointment at the moment or that have faced disappointment. And because of that disappointment, they have stepped away from you. And in a way, they have stepped away from themselves. And their hearts are sick. And Lord, I pray that you would come and step into those situations, just as Jesus stepped into the situation with the two disciples. And Lord, that you would come and minister, Lord, that you would come and remind us of what you are busy with, that you would come and show us everything that you have done already. Lord, that we would see your faithfulness and your goodness, and that in that you will also help us to see what you are doing right now. And Lord, I pray that every one of us will be able to bring this disappointment to you, God, and say, this is not what I expected, but I'm going to hope that beyond this, there's something greater, there's something bigger, there's something better. And I want to surrender my life to you, God. Even if the things that I really hope for don't happen, I believe that you have something better. And God, I want to pray for people who maybe have faced many disappointments and they aren't at a space right now where they can say this. Lord, I pray that you will come and meet them. I pray that you will come and bring people into their hearts and into their lives. And I pray, God, that you would allow them and help them, Lord, to not just seek you, but to also seek the counsel of friends, friends that can speak into their lives and pray with them and process the disappointment with them. Lord, we want to trust for healing. We want to trust for restoration. And we want to trust for redemption, Lord, that you want to come and redeem all those stories, all those disappointments, and you want to come and make it a better story. And Lord, I pray that as we, as we sing this song now, Holy Spirit, will you just come and stir our faith again? 
Will you help us, Lord, to believe that you are good, that you are faithful, that you are true? And Lord, even though we don't understand, we choose to love you. We choose to trust you, even if you're an unpredictable God, even if you're a God that does things that we don't expect and that we we don't understand. We choose to love you and we choose to trust you because we know that you are our best option. You are our best option for this world and for this life. And we thank you, God. Thank you that we can take the pressure off of ourselves to give our lives to you and say, Lord, come and deal with our expectations. Come and deal with our dreams and our hopes and our desires. And Lord, we want to thank you for everything that you have done in our lives so far. So I pray right now, Lord, as we're going into a time of worshiping you, will you come and minister? Will you come and speak to us? And Jesus, will you come and reveal yourself into our situations so that we stop asking why, but we start asking, where are you and what are you doing? And what are you asking me to do in the situation? So I pray for hope to be restored and I pray for faith to arise. In Jesus' name, amen. And I am holding on to faith And I know you'll make a way I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it you make mountains move you make giants fall you use songs of praise to shake prison walls and i will speak to my fear i will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then you were faithful now Oh, you were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. And I know that I know you'll never fail. Yes, I know that I know you never will. I know that I know you'll never fail. Yes, I know that I know you never will. You make mountains move, you make giants fall, you use songs of praise to shake prison walls, and I will speak to my fear. And I will preach to my doubt That you were faithful then You'll be faithful now You make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls And I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. Oh, you were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. Oh, you were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. Amen. So church, I hope that somewhere in all of this that you can find the courage and the strength to say, you know, even though I want to give up and stop, I've had enough of this, that you will hear the voice of hope saying, come on, let's try again. Let's keep going and put your faith in God, put your hope in God. And so 
I want to invite you, if you want to continue this conversation, um, please get in contact with us. You can find us on the comment section. But also, um, we will have discussions in the week where we can reason together, where you can ask some more questions. So we really want to invite you. Please join us for that. And uh, I hope that in all of this, that you will continue journeying with God, but that you will also invite people to come and journey with you. So have a wonderful Sunday further. We are going to continue in worship now. So um, please uh, don't just leave. We have some more songs coming so that we can just step into God's presence some more and worship Him and allow Him to minister to us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Every Nation Twane. My name is Yulani, and we are just so happy to be with you um, today, whether it's morning or night and just worship with all of you. So we just want to invite you wherever you are, um, whether you want to stand up or sit down, um, but let's just go into a time of worshiping God through our music um, and let's turn our hearts and our gaze towards Him.
So we are introducing a new song today, um, written in our bigger spiritual family. And this, this song is all about um, the name of Jesus. Proverbs 18 that says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and those who run into, we are safe. So um, it also says that we should call upon the name of Jesus. So in every single situation that we find ourselves in, we can call upon His name. We are justified through His name. There's healing in His name. There is power in His name. So as we sing this song, let's proclaim this and let's believe it. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in. In the name of the Lord, there is power. Yes, you are the name above all names. Guye on Galali, Guye on Gazeli, Yenu Tembegile, Yenu Tembegile. Gizoli biza, gizoli biza, iga.
Ibiza Ki zol Ibiza you Jesus that that we are justified in your name that that we can call upon your name anytime Jesus that there is power in your name help us Holy Spirit to to know to know our authority in you Jesus we thank you Thank you that we also know that there is blessing in your name and that we can proclaim blessing over our nation, that we can proclaim blessing over our families. Thank you, Jesus.
His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family, your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family your children and their children and their children may say the Father, we just thank you for blessing us. Thank you that since the beginning of time, your intention was that people will be blessed and that people will be blessed through Jesus, through your son. We thank you for that. Thank you that we can have that, that we can know that we know that we are blessed just because we are your children. 
and thank you that we can proclaim that over our families, over our spiritual families, over our leadership, over this country, over this world, Father. Thank you for blessing us, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Thank you for joining us and please remember to fill in the connection card and join us for the after party. See you next week. Bye-bye. Sabah kira. Bye.